Hall, who's going to talk to us about deep sea mining from the Norwegian perspective. But uh, really excited for this. Uh, I, I got to know Igal over the last year. He's a real expert on deep sea mining, has, has spoken many times on the topic. And I think this is going to be a, a wonderful presentation. And uh, I really want to thank Igal for, for spending the time and look forward to his insights. So uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Oliver. Great uh, honor to uh, follow your webinar series. And uh, yeah, it has been a really exciting year. Uh, and a lot of things um, happens right now as we're speaking, both in Norway and also, of course, in the international scene. So uh, I will uh, do a um, um, presentation over the next uh, 30 minutes about kind of the main uh, activities in Norway. So I focus mostly on Norway now, although I give a little bit of overview of, of the rest of the world, but mostly this is from the Norwegian perspective. So, um, I represent the Innovation Forum for Marine Minerals, where I'm Secretary General. Uh, we started this in 2019, and then we have around 25 companies and institutions um, uh, with us. And as you can see, it's, it's an association of industry and research actors who work together to develop knowledge and expertise in a Norwegian industry aimed at sustainable and responsible exploration and extraction of marine mineral resources. So that is the uh, the um, the forum. Now, um, just for those of you who are not familiar with deep sea mining, I just for completeness, I just give you the three types of uh, deposits that we find, and that would be the polymetallic nodules to the left, kind of uh, potato-sized uh, metal-rich uh, nodules found in. Uh, around the world in, uh, in abundance uh, and um, uh, on great depths mostly. You have the cobalt rich manganese crust, as you can see in the mid middle uh, picture, that is um, uh, metal enriched uh, crust on uh, sea mounds typically. They are also found in uh, many places around the world. And then you have the seabed massive sulfites, also called SMS, which you find in um, uh, various places uh, along spreading ridges. And I will give you a little bit of insight where you find these in the next uh, slide. So, um, but before I do that, I just go for the motivation. Why do we even think of doing the deep sea mining? And uh, of course, we are in an energy transition, a green shift meaning that we need more metals and minerals to uh, feed this transition. There are geopolitical challenges for access to raw materials. As we know, uh, the world has been globalized for the last 30 years. Now it seems like it's a little bit uh, challenged towards um, uh, this uh, globalization and there will be um, uh, competition to get the right minerals and metals uh, from around the world. Uh, it has a potential for a really in profitable industry. So we have a very profitable industry on terrestrial mining, but this could be a very profitable industry for marine mining. And of course, that follows also potential for job creation. So that is kind of motivation for deep sea mining as a, as a beginning. Now, where do we find these uh, deep sea minerals? Well, uh, this map shows you the spreading ridges. And as I said, uh, where you have the spreading ridges, uh, there you also have uh, uh, possibilities to find these sulfide uh, deposits. And along the spreading ridges and other places, as you can see on the, the map here, you have these sea mounts. You know, around where Santa Elena is around here and you know there are there are a few of these uh, Azores is up here and all those sea mounts that means mountains uh, uh, underwater and uh, there is a possibility to have this crust uh, if, if they're steep enough and so on and then the vast area uh, let's say in the Pacific and uh, to the left here and also in the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic you can you can find the polymetallic nodules. 
so uh, it's spread uh, around this area and remember that the water uh, on earth uh, represents something like 70 percent of the surface so we're talking about vast areas and huge potential for such minerals so the next uh, so i will focus later you see the square up here that is the um, area that i would discuss because that is norway's area and norway as you can see uh, is part of the uh, upper mid-atlantic rift and uh, in the mid-atlantic rift you see iceland here so that's just in the middle of of the uh, of the rift um i will go into more details in in a later slide I just give you another slide showing uh, kind of who owns this. And uh, as you can see that the coast states, uh, they own 200 nautical miles of their coast. And that is the, what's called exclusive economic zone, the EZ. And you see also those blobs around there. They are typically islands belonging to, uh, to some uh, countries or independent countries. And they also have 200 nautical miles. In addition to that, you also have uh, places where there are microcontinents, like I can show you soon from Norway, we have an island called Jan Main, which is up here where the arrow is, if you see it. And that is at, uh, at that place, um, you can go to the international uh, court and ask to get an extended continental shelf beyond the 200 nautical miles. And that is uh, um, something that you can see in several places, but you have to argue well to get it. Norway has been lucky to get quite a lot of uh, extended economic zones um, uh, in addition to, to what it already has. Okay, so there was a little bit of the, um, the overall picture of, of uh, oh yeah, I forgot to say that what is not shaded, what is not, the rest, the rest is basically called the area, and the area is governed by United Nations uh, through its uh, agency, the International Seabed Authority, ISA, and they are in the midst of uh, regulating this to uh, see how to um, exploit uh, this uh, huge 50% of, uh, of the area of the Earth's resources. And um, uh, one of our uh, people at, at uh, NMM actually just came back from Kingston in Jamaica, where the third part of the 28th session of the ISA was held last week. And um, uh, they are working hard now to get laws and regulations ready for and hopefully uh, a production uh, licensing scheme in 2025. So uh, that's the big picture. So if we now go down to, uh, yeah, here's again this area where Norway has got. Here's that, that, that rectangle, as I showed you. So you see Norway to the right. You see Greenland hidden a little bit behind that um, legend. And you have Iceland to, uh, to, the, um, to the lower left. So the area that I'm talking about, and now you see it's not those uh, kind of cartoonish uh, lines, it's a little bit more complicated. The Mid-Atlantic Rift consists, maybe you can see the cursor, and then you can see that it, it's going down kind of in ridges. It's going to be called the Kniebrot Ridge, and then it's the Moons Ridge, and there is uh, and John Mine, as, as I said, that is the microcontinent that is owned by Norway, and that makes the continental shelf of Norway extended. You can see the outer outline of the area, uh, which is then um, uh, outside the 200 nautical miles, which is normally drawn from a certain uh, fixed point. And your mind is an island, so it's above uh, sea, so it's, it's an island. You can draw that 200 nautical miles. It's also that you have these, these yellow lines drawn from the mainland. And also Svalbard, which is uh, also part of Norway, has also got their own uh, 200 nautical miles. And that area, this, this area that has been uh, denoted, uh, this kind of irregular area, that is the area that was originally uh, thought to be part of the Norwegian uh, deep sea mining uh, uh, 
yeah, area to be decided upon by the, the government. That area that has been uh, uh, outlined <clears throat> is a regular shape. That has an area, a total area of 592,000 square kilometers, which is twice the Norway's land area. So it's, it's a huge area. And uh, the, I will show you a few pictures later when you see why this has been uh, given like this. Some of this, as you can see, some of it's international waters uh, where we don't have any ownership. Some is owned by Iceland on the lower left and some, yeah, so it, it, it varies a little bit. Now, if I go to um, the next slide here, then you see that there is a, a Seabed Mineral Act from, from Norway. It was, uh, this was, uh, this started in July 1st, 2019. So we have actually, the regulation is ready in Norway. That has been ready for four years now. So we are ready to, um, in order, as soon as we open the, uh, the shelf, then we have the regulations for how to, to do it. And it's based mostly on the uh, Norwegian Oil and Gas Act. So um, uh, the, the um, entity that governs this is the uh, Ministry of um, Energy, um, uh, oil, oil and Energy. And uh, its um, a direct operator is the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate. They also hand over all the licensing for oil and gas in Norway. Uh, they have been doing that for the last 50 years. And now they have, in a way, copied. They haven't copied, but they have taken a lot of um, ideas and inspiration and um, knowledge from that experience and from the laws towards marine minerals. So that is in place. And then here is an important timeline. So um, if you remember, uh, we, the law came in, in was, was uh, put in operation in July 2019. Then on the left, there was a opening program phase on second quarter of 2020, where Norway started the job to open up the waters. But in order to do that, we need a thorough way of hearings and impact assessments throughout a program phase 2020 to 2021 then an investigation phase from the first quarter uh or second quarter 22 uh then a reporting phase uh the third quarter second third quarter of 22 and then there will be a decision phase which happens in the second quarter of or actually it, it has been postponed so it will it will be fourth quarter of 2023, which basically means in December, and there will be a decision first quarter 2024. So we are just months from opening up the um, uh, Norwegian shelf for deep sea mining. And the um, uh, final decision will be at the, at the government. And um, so let, let's see what happens. Uh, um, we, need, we, we need to have it um, uh, yeah, decided uh, by a, a, a full government. Anyway, here is a little bit more detail of that area that I showed you in the beginning. This is uh, uh, a map showing uh, in Norwegian here, but, but I guess you can understand what it is. You have manganese uh, crust, that is this um, cobalt-rich uh, manganese crust in these blobs around here, they have been found. These are found on sea mounds. Uh, and you see that uh, the ridges are kind of in between those uh, uh, circles. Then the hydrothermal means, as it's in English, hydrothermal deposits, active and inactive. So you have these other uh, blobs, the active, they are, they are given names, so if there's just seven sisters, and uh, some kind of fairy tales names, Agirshild, uh, Moonskat, Loki, uh, Loki, uh, Castle, and so on. And then you have the uh, inactive uh, deposits as well. So just to, to tell you that since uh, the main 
Um, wow. One of the main oppositions towards deep sea mining has been the environmental issues. So, uh, so most of the of all companies, I think, have kind of been quite clear that the active uh, hydrothermal deposits will not be drilled or mined. There will be the inactive, meaning those uh, chimneys uh, or smokers, as they are called, uh, which are now extinct. They are not. Uh, spewing out uh, material. So uh, note also that no polymetallic nodules uh, have been found in the Norwegian waters. And why is that? Well, I don't know. I mean, it, that could that could be. But note that the polymetallic nodules they have been formed by accumulating uh, ions, if you like, or metal ions on uh, on kind of uh, uh, a small particle, uh, some small pieces on the seafloor, and they have just accumulated like a pearl in, a, in, a, in, a, in an oyster. So, so you need a, a seed or, or a, um, yeah, to start, and then it accumulates very slowly and um, the polymagnes, uh, metallic nodules you find in the Pacific, they have been formed over, let's say, 25, 30 million years. So it's kind of uh, a centimeter per million years. It's a very slow uh, growth. Now, in the Atlantic, in the North Atlantic, we have a lot of erosion. So there are a lot of glaciers, especially when you think of the last two million years, we have had numerous uh, uh, glaciation periods. And that is the most efficient erosion agent on Earth. It scrapes off vast amounts of sediments. So you fill up the area and most likely the, the polymagnetic nodules have been kind of drowned in the sediments. I don't know if that is the, if that's the case, if they find something, I would be happy. But right now they haven't seen any polymetallic nodules there. Okay, so in Norwegian waters, we are looking for cobalt rich manganese crust and uh, seabed massive sulfides. SMS. All right. So, uh, after some political uh, maneuvering, I don't know, I, I won't be too political here, but <laughs> somehow, uh, somehow uh, in June 2023, now, now I'm into, we are, you know, not, not that long ago. The, um, the the government, uh, which is uh, a coalition of uh, labor and the central party, they decided to reduce the area from 592,000 square kilometers to 232,000. This pink area down here. So, so okay. So they they say that this is the most prolific area. So the, it has been reduced, but still you can see that that area. Uh, is kind of located along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is kind of bent of the Sklipovich Ridge and the Mons Ridge, and also a little bit more. They're taken out John Mine to the left, as you can see. So they're reduced, but still it's, it's, it's well, it's size of Norway, land area of Norway, approximately. So that is kind of the area that they're now going to uh, vote over, so to open this for uh, first exploration and then for uh, pr uh, production uh, subsequently. So um, yeah, here you see some more detailed maps of uh, kind of uh, the stars of manganese, manganese um, uh, or, or um, cobalt rich manganese crust. And then you have the, uh, again, these uh, circles, they are the hydrothermal sulfide. And you see some cores which have been taken up. And this has been made by the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate over uh, in a, yeah, around five years. The last five years, they've been on surveys to take samples. They, they do coring, as you can see. And the uh, University of Bergen, they have been doing, they have conducted uh, a lot of surveys uh, since uh, the beginning of 2000, actually. So there have been kind of a, 20 plus years of exploration 
uh, by research institutes and also by by MPD. And uh, you can also see on this map that the terrain is quite rugged. You know, it's it's not like this uh, these straight lines that you could see on the my first global map, if you like. Uh, and you see also on the right uh, kind of what materials they have found, what metals they have found in these cores. And you see it's it's kind of important important um, metals for the, for the green shift or for the energy transition. Now uh, here's another nice picture like uh, more like a bathymetric map and you see even better of course exaggerated uh, exaggerated uh, heights but still you can see the um, the terrain here and the, these these numbers are actually the um, uh, million years since it's it opened so 30 means it was uh, at at about 30 million years ago they, these two lines on both sides of the ridge uh, were uh, coincided so then you can just follow the, um, the spreading. It, uh, it, it moves at a certain speed. Some of these lines are kind of denser between themselves, meaning that it's, it's, it's slower uh, spread, spreading. Okay, so here's a good example of one of the, the samplers, uh, an ROV with a uh, yeah, sampling mechanism. I have to show you this one because it comes from the university which I belong to in uh, NTNU. Uh, there was a paper in 2019 which I find very fascinating. It's actually um, electromagnetic uh, work and this is probably the first time you have seen a picture through uh, this Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is right underneath the Loki Castle which has showed on one of those ridges. So this in the middle here, that is where the Loki Castle is. And you can see 120 kilometers down here, and you can see kind of the conductive layers being uh, the warm colors and the uh, resi resistive layers in the cold colors. And uh, you can use, this is used for oil and gas exploration, but in this case, we were lucky. I mean, the oil price were low, so it was possible to actually, <laughs> to, to get hold of, uh, uh, a boat to to do a, a survey for for a reduced cost, so it's kind of taken from um, uh, both expertise from land mining where they use EM methods, and also from oil and gas industry. And uh, you can see you can almost see into the surface, and you can also see on the shallower part, uh, kind of the uh, conductive and the uh, non-conductive layers, which could be good for prospecting when you are looking for the most prolific areas. Now, there was a resource assessment, assessment made from all those surveys by the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate in January 2023. And they, uh, they took hold of all the, the samples, analyzed them and uh, found uh, what they actually would uh, think uh, uh, is in the Norwegian waters. And here's, uh, I just did a back on the envelope uh, type of calculation. I took the, I took the, uh, the tonnage and I just calculated this with, I just uh, multiplied it with the price of metals, of, of various metals. The, these are metals are in Norwegian, but you see they're almost the same in, in English. So it's uh, mangan, it's manganese, vanadium. Well, that's so small that they didn't get, but, but the, the numbers are huge. They are, they're, they're staggering. You know, on the X axis, I'm talking about 4,000 billion NOx, which is uh, simplified. It's uh, a billion, a billion, uh, yeah. So, so it's, I mean, uh, you have to divide by 10 to get, to get dollars. So 4,000 means 400, do 400 million dollars. So you see that in manganese on the top here, we have the order of close to 400 million dollars uh, of value, titanium, titanium is of the order of 50, 60 million dollars, magnesium is next, lithium, cobalt, 200 million dollars, uh, silver, and so on. So if you add all, if you add this um, uh, up, then you go into huge numbers. So you are, uh, did I say million? I meant billion. Sorry about that if I confused you. So when I said, I, when I said 4,000, Billion Knox means 400 billion US dollars. Sorry. Yeah. So if you add it up, you get into 14.3 trillion Knox. And that is uh, about 
three trillion US dollars. And that is what they have kind of found just by these uh, investigations over the last of the last years. In addition, there's a huge amount of rare earth elements which I haven't included in this because the volumes are lower there and uh, it's a little bit hard to get the prices and so on. But in, all in all, it's we are talking about huge amounts of uh, values. And this, remember, this is just for the Norwegian, uh, Norwegian uh, uh, shelf in the area that I, I discussed. I think this is based on the 592,000 square kilometers. Uh, yeah, so it's not on this reduced side, but, but still it's a lot of value. So now back to the opening, um, we are in the, the final uh, round. And um, as I said, um, the date would be actually on January 9th. That was the last thing I heard. There will be a kind of a this is or a kind of a white paper that will be given uh, on December nineteenth, uh, I think, and then uh, the Parliament uh, will uh, come back after after Christmas, and then take a decision. And uh, it will be exciting. Um, there are three. How can I say? There are currently. I mean, those who started. Uh, we had a conservative government in 2020 when all this started. There's a conservative uh, coalition. Now we have a labor uh, coalition, and they are now governing this process. And then and you have also um, a progress party, which is for opening. So right, if you if I should get, make a guess that these two of the former uh, governments who actually worked on this, they are they 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 are naturally uh, for opening, I would think, and then you have the progress party. So right now it seems like there there will be an opening, but still uh, there are many uh, parties on the left, and there are some other parties uh, which are against this. So it's not straightforward, but. Let's see what happens. It's out of um, uh, our control. It's the politicians that will, will do that work now. So uh, just make a conclusion at the end here. So, so as you can see, there is a there is a need for major increase in critical metals and minerals to achieve the energy transition, um, and the critical metals um, uh, that, of course, varies in the, from year to year. But right now, most of the metals I showed you on that uh, calculation just a few slides back, they are actually very important for the uh, energy transition. So the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate prepared a resource report showing this major potential for critical metals minerals on the Norwegian continent that we shall. And uh, the Norwegian Parliament will make a decision on opening the Norwegian shell for deep sea mining Q1 2024. And uh, that is uh, so that could uh, be an exciting uh, beginning of the new year. And um, I thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, that was wonderful, um, really helpful. So now I'd I'd like to invite uh, questions and. Um, Becky, maybe you, you can talk, give the logistics of how we're going to do that. Sure. Um, you can either um, raise your hand uh, at the bottom and see a little raise hand button, or you're welcome to put comments in the chat. Uh, and I, I, I might start because I have a question. Um, so I and the raise hand icon is in the bottom of the toolbar, uh, the third one to the left of the red hang up. But maybe, uh, Igal, thanks for that. I, 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 my question is, can you tell us a little bit about what Norwegian companies, who are the companies, what are they doing for deep sea mining? Yeah, <clears throat> the, um, it's, it's interesting what happened around the beginning of this process, then we got three new companies that formed by themselves so it was the green minerals 
the ADEPs and the Loki Marine Minerals. They they were kind of startups, and they started almost immediately when the signals came from the government that we were going to open up in in a quite short time. So they have uh, been uh, working both on the Norwegian side and also on the um, international side. So, for instance, Loki Marine Minerals they have actually bought the uh, Lockheed Martin's uh, British entity in the Clare and Clifton zone, uh, about 155,000 square kilometers. And um, yeah, so, so that is one group. Then you have other groups uh, like in our, let's say in our uh, forum, uh, which I lead, uh, then we have geophysical companies typically, because the first phase will be exploration and uh, there is a need to, uh, to explore to get into more details. Um, so we have a number of um, of exploration companies, like service companies, um, and then we also have regulation companies. Like DMV is kind of into into regulations. We have uh, financial entities, and uh, we also have kind of interest organizations, like cluster organizations, and also. Uh, Norwegian management uh, kind of innovation Norway. They they are not partners as such, but they are kind of observers. So we have kind of observers also. There. Yeah, but it's it, there is an ecosystem which is kind of developing, evolving all the time in a way. I would say some companies come, new companies come in. There are some companies going out and so on. And um, but it, it's it's very and there's a lot of companies I think waiting for the decision. They just some of them are early, you know, ready. To start when it happens, and some are kind of waiting and just getting ready. I don't know what they do. They may be ready, just doing their own things, and then getting. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Um, next up, we have a question from Simon. Simon, you want to take yourself off? There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, Simon Holmstrom from um, CESA Trisk deep sea mining policy officer calling from brussels um uh, just yesterday a legal paper um unveiled unsettling flaws in the government's impact assessment related to 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 this opening uh, i'm sure that you've um, you've read it already um and this revelation urges us to to confront uncomfortable truths about the potential risks that we are willing to take um, and the toll it might, ex um, might have on the uh, diverse uh, tapestry of ocean life. Um, our oceans are not just a, you know expanse of water, they are living, breathing entities interconnected and pulsating with life. And I must say, I'm a little bit surprised, Egil, that you didn't mention this at all in your presentation. How can we guarantee that the impacts of deep sea mining in this area will not send shockwaves around um, and through the delicate balance of neighboring regions? That's that's a very interesting question I think you, you must address here as well. Yeah, I haven't read the uh, report you referred to. I just came back from Rio uh, for a conference on deep sea mining uh, yesterday. So uh, I just hardly been in Norway. So uh, so I, I haven't seen that. But uh, uh, thank you for uh, for commenting on the environmental uh, aspect. And you are right. Um, the, it was not by, by purpose of avoiding that. It's a huge, uh, it's a huge topic, and I think uh, you are right. It's the critical uh, question to ask uh, in order to get this running, and in order for the parliament to uh, to decide uh, on what they will decide. Then you, you need to have uh, a good plan to do this in uh, in a sustainable and responsible way. And if you attend the beginning of my talk, I showed my forum has this as the uh, foundation uh, of, of the form itself, responsible and environmental friendly way to do this. So, so, uh, so that, that is kind of our kind of uh, in, in the roots of our system. But when it comes to the, uh, to the impact assessment, which um, was held around 2022, and there were two actually hearings and there was a lot of um, um, companies and uh, organizations and so on that came up with all kind of um, uh, yeah uh, uh, comments regarding the danger of doing this. And um, I think the um, I think the information 
of the um, oh, let's let's say let let's put it like this: when the politicians get their uh, white paper or their kind of the paper they have to decide on, I think we have addressed uh, a lot of these issues: kind of the vulnerability of the ecosystems, uh, the need for the regulators, if it's opened, to have very strict um, uh, regulations for the companies. And uh, I think you can use an example of 50 years of oil and gas exploration in uh, the North Sea. And uh, there are very strict regulations there. You are, you are not allowed to, to do, I mean, there's not much you, you, you can uh, do there that harm the environment that, uh, that would not be regulated and, and being taken care of. And that is one of the reasons why I think it's uh, possible to start in Norway because we are so used to this very strict regulations environmental wise. Um, so so it's, um, it, it's of course um, possible to argue that there is too little known uh, about the uh, fragile ecosystem uh, in the waters. And I think um, that in order to know more about this, an exploration campaign, which will be the first start of such uh, a deep sea mining operation, that will give uh, a lot of new information that you otherwise wouldn't have had. And that makes it even better. Um, it, it will give us better ideas how to eventually make a safe production phase. You know, but but without that, we will be in the unknown. It's very expensive to, to run such uh, surveys, and very little. Ma many comment that as little is known in the in the deep waters. But that's of course because there is no rational enough for the states to uh, to go down and fund that. So there is no opportunity as well. But um, uh, by all means, uh, the, it was not my purpose to say that you are just going out there and just go for all these minerals without taking care of the environment. That's a fragile system and, and I think it's important to, to use a lot of time and effort to, to get it done. But I think it will follow along the, uh, the, the start of the exploration phase. I hope that helped a little bit, Simon. So you have to send me that uh, paper that you referred to. I haven't seen that. All right. First step. Let's see, Kristen, you're on mute. No, I think exactly, I just had to find <laughs> the unmute button. Hello, my name is Kerstin Kruger. I'm, um, I used to be part of the UK delegation to, to the ISA, but I'm now with Queen's University Belfast working on the Trident project, which is um, it's a EU project looking into the development of um, monitoring techniques, real-time monitoring techniques um, for deep sea mining. However, I'm, I'm more on exploring the legal landscape of deep sea mining in an international, national European context. So I have a question with regards to the Hafbun Mineral Loven Eagle. Is simple question: Is that actually available in English? Because my Norwegian is not good enough to read it at all. <laughs> Norwegian. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very interesting. No, I don't think it is. But it, it it's a very simple. I I can send it to you. It's very simple to just do a Google Translate or something. Yeah. Like that. And you oh, should be able yeah, to read I, it. I, I so, have the Norwegian, I, I know where to yeah. find it on the Norwegian web pages. So. But, but of course, uh, since this is a legal document, uh, then of course it's not really straightforward to do a Google Translate because, you know, the, the subtleties would be probably. Oh, yeah. I, I guess there is a reason why it's not in English. They, they, you need to do a thorough uh, legal scrutiny. Yes, I I, I'm, you know, being. being a native German speaker and operating in an English context, I'm I'm so aware of you know things getting lost in translation. Yeah, I'm so, sure if you have been to ISA and been following the discussions there, I guess you, you know all about that. I'm not a lawyer myself, but but yeah. I see absolutely how important these things are. But um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, the other yeah, point yeah. I wanted to make is. Um, also having worked on oil and gas with operators and having been on a Norwegian um, explorative rig 
as part of the um, Serpent project up in the uh, Baden Sea. I'm, I'm very much aware of how careful, how environmentally conscious the uh, Norwegian or the legislation in the Norwegian sector for oil and gas is. But in my opinion, you cannot really compare impacts of oil and gas and um, the whole situation of oil and gas exploration, even off the continental shelf, if, although I know it's not off the continental shelf um, happening at the moment, um, with deep sea mining, because the um, the spatial footprint and the temporal footprint, you know, they are, they are hugely different. I mean, the spatial footprint of offshore oil and gas is tiny. I mean, I'm not, I'm honestly, as even, you know, as a deep sea ecologist, I'm not particularly worried about the, um, you know, how oil and gas get, get produced as such. It's more what we do with it at the other end that I'm worried about. So I just, I, I just want to caution against putting oil and gas so much into the forefront. A lot about oil and gas regulation is also about um, decommissioning and the likes. And of course, you know, for for offshore, you know, for deep sea mining, all that is on a completely different scale and not that relevant, really. I mean, looking at aggregate legislation, is probably makes much more sense than at all in gas legislation because the impacts are far more similar to deep sea mining than the impacts more in gas. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm a geophysicist uh, by training myself, so so uh, so I'm kind of familiar with the kind of the impact you do uh, with, for instance, seismic recordings and. Of course, um, there's been a lot of discussion on the environmental impacts of, for instance, seismic shooting and so on, on fish and so on. So, so that's from oil and gas. Uh, when it comes to the area, I'm not sure if I follow you there, because if you look at the North Sea, for instance, it has been covered completely with 3D seismic. They have been shooting seismics in the 60s. So yeah, it's a but that's also the same for wind. You know, that's, that's the same for offshore wind, offshore renewables. They need to do seismic. But again, seismic is, you know, it's the, the, the temporal footprint is very small. Yes, it is. But the uh, seismic will be one of the leading candidates for doing exploration in the first phase. But when it comes to the comparison with oil and gas, so, so I use that as an example of the strict regulations because there has been so much opposition to all kinds of things that could go wrong. And we all know that sometimes you get uh, spills of oil and that is vast. It will take, I mean, you can just think of uh, the, the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico and deep water horizon. So, so, so yes, we are very conscious of that. And, um, and, and my point is, and since this was from a Norwegian perspective, okay, I was invited by Oliver to talk about the Norwegian perspective. So our experience, in Norway is that we are very careful because we know the consequences are so grave. So it's more like an example from oil and gas. And the same thing I could say that we use the example of technology development from expertise we have from the oil and gas. You could say the same thing, what, where did we get the expertise from oil and gas, apart from uh, getting it from uh, the major countries up, you know, the America, the France, Germany, UK. But of course it was from the Norwegian fishing industry. So we had a lot of expertise, the seismic boats, no one had trawlers. So replacing the trawler with a seismic cable was kind of easy in a way when you knew what to use it for. Mm. And the same with all the steel, uh, the, the, the wharfs and that could make it. So, so it's more like a comparison, it's not one-to-one. -one. So, so I'm not trying to say this is the same. It's the same with that law, that regulation. It's based upon ideas from a success story, I would say from the Norwegian oil and gas sector. Mm. With very you, you take the principles, the, yes, the general yes. principle of, yeah, of more. care and yes. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So this is more like a comparison of the precautionary principle of what we have done in oil and gas because we have had to do that in order to operate. So I think we could use as a leading example, if we can open up Norwegian shelf and show that this can be done in a, in a prudent and uh, environmental friendly way then this could be a good example for the rest of the world. That, that is yeah. kind of my the reason for using those yeah. examples. That's but, why we all look at you with interest, or look at Norway with interest. So, um, but also, you know, it's not that you set out being very precautionary in the first place. Just, you know, look at when the first oil was 
produced, you know, around Stavanger and the big, you know, the accidents that happened there. It's just that this industry, you know, deep sea mining is the very first time where actually regulations will be put into place before we start with the exploration. So just oh, yeah. you know, to get the right here. <laughs> no, no, I see your point. And of course, we 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 um, we hopefully have learned from experiences in the past to be better. So that's kind of continual uh, improvement. So. So hopefully that so but but thanks good comments yeah. thank you very much great eagle we've had three um questions come in on chat and then we'll go back to raised hands so the first one is from kiran who says if i may know what will be the extraction technologies that will be used for various metals that you listed well uh i'm a geophysicist as i said so i have to be a little bit careful here i just know that uh, there are many uh, people with with ingenious ideas and uh, important metals is one of them so i know that there's a lot of kind of uh, you know ways to uh, to get this up of course uh if you look at the white paper that came from uh, after the first hearing uh, it seems like uh, there is a, a way to go. I mean, we are talking about exploration first, and then we have to go through uh, a next phase. Uh, so I think there will be ample time to find methods to get it up. Uh, and of course, um, if you look at all the pieces that are needed, then it's the, the extraction itself from the sea bottom. I think that you can learn a lot from the mining industry. There's a lot of techniques to do there. Then you have the way to get it from the sea bottom up to the vessel that will be more like the equivalent to what we just discussed on the oil and gas with the riser technologies and so on slurry or pumps or containers i don't know um, and then um, uh, the rest for uh, shipping it off to some place to process it into metals so um i don't think uh, the technology has been matured yet i think we are waiting for uh, an opening giving the incentive to start investing in developing these techniques it was a good example from uh, from Kerstin here who said that in Stavanger in uh, 1967 80 that's where I'm from I'm from Stavanger I remember those times and of course there was very immature it was copied over from other countries it most was taken over from Gulf of Mexico some uh, and, and it was improved and in 20, I think 2002, three or four, then the oil sector, the service sector in Norway was the second largest industry in Norway from nothing. So I think that the development of extraction equipment, I'm not sure if it will be Norway that will lead that, but there will, as long as there is an industry with the need for equipment, then I think there is a lot of uh, uh, companies out there uh, who could uh, work on that. I, I have to say that we have a sister uh, organization in Germany called the Deep Sea Mining Alliance, the SMA, and, and there they have a lot of companies with kind of technologies that uh, could, uh, could could help uh, get those extraction uh, equipment uh, ready. Well, it's not a good answer, but uh, so it's more like, yeah. So, so, so Igor, we're, we're approaching 10 minutes left and we have three people with their hands raised, two no, more no, questions. No, no, it will be quick. I will answer very uh, short answers. Rapid fire now. Uh, over to you, Becky. Yeah, I'm. Uh, so there's a question from Robin about impacts on biodiversity from mining methods. Now, I think uh, Eagle just explained, uh, uh, answer that the methods aren't developed yet and during the exploration phase was what would when you would be starting to um look at some of those impacts so we'll skip on to the next one uh, that's where you go through your environmental assessment process um do several norwegian companies presented and mentioned they had tested nodule collection um but i would believe that would have been norwegian companies in the ccz it would that i would that yes. be more correct yeah correct, so that correct. would be in the, in the area. Um, um, Simon provided a link to a environmental impact assessment or legal paper uh, uh, that we can take a, that people can take a look at. Um, today, uh, Seas at Risk published news on the opposition to the Norwegian plans here. So Simon provided a link, um, another yeah. link as well. So if you'd like to take a look at those, you can. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh we talked about extraction technologies um uh kirsten and uh, could the methodology developed by impossible metals be applied here no 
uh, because there are no nodules, and we are very specific to nodules. <laughs> so let's. But I, let's I, I, I did say that there were no nodules, but they haven't found. Yeah, no yet. nodules. <laughs> so let's go to our raised hands at this point. Um, uh, Jorge, uh, if that's if that's hopefully I spelled said your name correctly. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Thanks, Becky. Uh, so yeah, I'm Jorge Oskategui. I'm senior analyst from Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. So particularly uh, focusing on nickel and cobalt forecasting, um, meaning we analyze, you know, supply, demand, uh, price forecast, and I focus on those particular products. Um, very good presentation, Egil. So uh, very interesting and in seeing how advanced, yeah, the Norwegian government is in this area at the moment. Um, and yeah. Uh, just, you know, we, we like to keep on top of things and looking at deep sea mining, uh, particularly recently, um, because of what's happening with the ISA and obviously TMC and a few of other European companies out there, Demi Group. So obviously from my uh, own perspective and point of view, I want to understand a little bit more how soon after the Norwegian parliament makes a decision in opening the exclusive economic zone for deep sea mining, do you reckon uh, companies could actually start um, outputting some of these uh, vast resources that you were just talking about previously? And are you aware of any other countries that are looking to also exploit uh, the crust or massive sulfides? Because we get a lot of news out there about polymetallic nodules, but not so much about the other two uh, type of deposits. I think if, uh, thanks, uh, thanks for good, good questions. I think uh, that um, if you look at first, okay, 9th of January, if, if you get the green light there, I think there would be, um, uh, there must be some kind of uh, setting up licenses and there would be a bidding round, I guess, for licensing and the exploration phase is third. So I would guess that the first exploration, and if that is successful and it seems to be worthwhile going for production, then I would I would just guess that it takes. Uh, I, I would be surprised if it starts with production before 2030. Okay, but uh, that that's just the, the gut feeling. Because it, it takes time. I mean, every, everything takes time. You need to, to get things. When it comes to um, um, the other question, I'm not aware of uh, any other countries doing crust. There may be some of you guys here. Um, I, I know SMS was uh, the big project in Papua New Guinea in Bismarck Sea when, when uh, Nautilus was there. Uh, I don't know if that is still uh, in Solvara. I mean, and there are a lot of uh, test uh, and scientific operations around, but not commercially as far as I know, but I'm sure there are people here who know more about that than me, but I, I'm not aware of that. The Cook Island has all the legislation ready, but I guess that is polymetallic. Uh, John, I guess you are around here. <laughs> I guess that is polymetallic. Not this. Yeah. Okay, and uh, then we'll pass it over to Dr. Sharma. <clears throat> Hi, good evening. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Yes. Okay, good. <clears throat> Uh, well, I have seen a few reports of uh, the different types of metals that are found in Norwegian EEZ, uh, which seem to include copper, zinc, magnesium, cobalt, etc. Uh, my question would be that uh, what would be, according to you, the driver metal for mining, if at all, in the Norwegian EEZ, either from Norwegian point of view or from the global point of view? What do you mean by driver? I mean, what will determine whether to go ahead for exploitation oh, yeah. of the mineral? I don't know. I think that uh, when you do the exploration and you start to look at the cost of getting up the various metals and look at the price and look at the extraction techniques and the depth and the uh, occurrences, that will decide that. But And of course, the need, the market will decide that. So if, I mean, look at these numbers, the metals you mentioned, I mean, copper is, is, is something that whatever you do with your batteries, if you replace uh, lithium with uh, sodium, I mean, you would need copper. So copper is a driver. I, you know, and then you have other nickel, of course, it's hard to replace it. I mean, 
yeah. So I, I uh, and of course the, the vast amounts is manganese, but of course if you have the polymetallic nodules with the vast amounts of nickel, that would be uh, uh, that is almost too much nickel on the market. So so I'm not sure. A copper, I guess, is uh, if 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 I would guess, I would think of copper is, uh, is, uh, is a good good bet. Okay. Thank you. Okay, a uh, few minutes left here. Lastly, um, Mike uh, Reagan, um, it says, here's my question for the professor. And I'm unsure who the professor is. Maybe we have a professor here who invited their class to attend. So uh, if you would like to answer this question, professor, by all means, um, there's a question about, um, could you discuss the role and more importantly, significance of collaboration between academic institutions and industry players in this field? In addition, how do these partnerships contribute to the technological innovation, environmental sustainability and economic feasibility in deep sea mining? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I work at the university myself and uh, that's the, the key, I think, in order to get things done right. You have to cooperate with every institutions, not only economics and scientific and so on, but also with ecological, environmental, law, uh, you, 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 you name it. I think the, uh, the, the ecosystem also in terms of, uh, of research is uh, tremendously important here. And that's one of the driver for me, you asked about the metal driver, but for me, the driver is that the, the vast uh, area and, and the scope it's it's potentially enormous benefits here i mean we we are into something that can really solve a number of problems and here we are talking about metals for energy transition and we have to do this in the right way it's very complex many many issues to take care of and then you need to, to actually put as much as you can together in order to to understand what we are going to do in order to get it in the right way. So by all means, and if the professor would like to, to get in touch, uh, please, uh, we, have a, we have many people here who would like to cooperate. I don't know where you are from, but, but I'm sure you will find some interest. Brilliant, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. And I mean, that's one of the reasons we hold these webinars is to bring everyone together. And I know we have people on the call who are representing a lot of different institutions and have a lot of different viewpoints on deep sea mining. And um, only by bringing all of those viewpoints together can we start to, you know, really tease out the material issues and um, just have discussions to try to come up with the best solutions and path forward. So I really appreciate everyone being willing to be part of the conversation and a big thank you to Eagle for his uh, awesome presentation, obviously well received from the amount of questions that we've had today. So um, we will be um, publishing a video of this talk um, on our YouTube page and um, Keep an eye out for our next ones. Uh, Oliver, do you want to tell everyone what the next one is? I'm not sure. Is it your, you're up next? Oh, Oliver, you're muted. So Holly, I think you're, you're going to close us out with the okay. next one, I believe. Yes, I had to get myself off mute. So everybody, thank you so much for coming. Our next one, um, Oliver will be, be presenting on inconvenient facts about LFP batteries. And that's on Friday, December 15th, same time. And I'll go ahead and send a, a link off to the registration form for that one. I send you the link to this webinar on our YouTube page. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ingo. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Adi. Have a good weekend. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone.